Welcome back, Guardians. Forget about weapon crafting, the glaive, cross play, legendary campaign missions, light subclass updates, and anti cheat for trials. And let's talk about the massive story bombshells that were dropped in the Bungie 2021 Witch Queen showcase. This video will not contain spoilers for the recently released Season of the Lost, even though that was also covered in the live stream. I will not be using any of the newly released lore from Season of the Lost either, so you're safe there. Rather, I'm going to break down all of the story related information that was provided during the live stream and give you some additional lore context using what we already know. But before starting, this video is sponsored by Bungie, the Destiny ANZ team, the team who look after Australia and New Zealand, reached out to me to see if I would be interested in talking lore about Savathun. If you are in Australia or New Zealand, you should definitely check out their Twitter account as they do organize events for the Destiny community when we can do them again. And they also do giveaways for the region. I will link their Twitter below. I'll also be live streaming over on Twitch as per usual each day. Link is below too. This is Marlin Games and I hope you enjoy this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. Right, first thing is first, we need to watch the Witch Queen reveal trailer in its entirety. Let's go. Holy moly, let's break this down. So project lead Blake Battle and creative director James Sai go on to talk about how our understanding of the light and the darkness is more complicated than we thought. They would then confirm that this space in the trailer is Sabathun's throne world. So not as I previously speculated it being the Dreaming City. The design of Savathun's throne world is very important as it fits into this theme of discovering the truth. Savathun says this in the trailer, Truth is a funny thing. Does it live in the world or in the mind? I believe this emphasizes that truth is a matter of perspective and Savathun created her throne world based on her perspective, her truth, which is she's no longer the villain. And you see this visually in the design of her throne world. Savathun resides in this literal castle of light, which is surrounded by this jungle of darkness and even a destroyed pyramid ship. This is meant to represent Savathun rejecting the darkness. The creative director, James, straight out confirms this perspective. I'm going to read to you what he said because it's a bit of information overload and it helps to read it a bit slower. So he said this, Savathun's throne, this is an uncharted wonderland of secrets and lies. 
It is this place she created in her own image, this surreal and majestic light-blessed world. She has this castle that she rules from. It overlooks this dark, swampy underbelly with this lone pyramid ship out there. It is the future world that she wanted to create, built to top the darkness she left behind. So this is what I think Savathun is talking about when she mentions, is the truth in the world or in the mind. Savathun has created her throne world in her vision of her truth, the future world that she wants to see, where the hive are aligned with the light and not the darkness. In general, throne worlds are very significant when it comes to the hive. The hive did not always have a pact with the worm gods. They originally lived short lives and were preyed upon by other species on the planet the Fundament. When Oryx accepted the bargain with the Worm Gods, he agreed for all the Hive to take on a symbiotic pact with the Worms. The Worms granted them power and immortality. Of course, the downside was that they needed to continually feed their Worm through death and killing, and they must also obey their nature. As the Worm grows in power, so did their hunger, so it very quickly snowballed into becoming a cycle of conquest. As Oryx became more powerful, his will was so strong that it just created a throne world. He was killed by his sister, Savathun, and he just didn't die. Have a listen to the weakness verse from the Books of Sorrow. It reads, Your body is gone, but you have endured, safe in the cyst universe created by your own might, your throne world. From this day forward, Oryx, you and your sisters will each survive death, so long as you aren't killed in your own throne. Right, so we don't really understand why this happened, similar to why we don't really understand why Marisov just created the Awoken home planet from her will when she jumped into a singularity. I think it is a matter of accepting that Oryx became so powerful with the help of the worm bargain that he just persisted beyond death. And like the entry says, the only way to kill Oryx and his sisters is to destroy them in their throne worlds. This is why in The Taken King, we had to destroy Oryx twice, once in our reality and then again in his throne world, which was his dreadnought. So the idea that the Witch Queen takes place in Savathun's throne world would imply that we intend to permanently take her out. That being said, the Hive have also been known to put other countermeasures within their throne worlds to bump up their death resilience, so to speak. The Oversoul is a good example of this. I would expect that if we find our way into Savathun's throne world, there will be a number of defenses. Of course, Hive Guardians would be one of those defenses. You also have to wonder if this is all a trap. Could we ever truly discover Savathun's throne world? This almost seems like another trap of hers. I am assuming Season of the Lost will help set this up. Further, we also know that Savathun is trying to escape the Worm God Pact. She no longer wants to be tied to the Worm. If she gets rid of her Worm, how would this impact the functioning of her throne world? Would Savathun pursue the light to remain immortal? This is all uncharted territory. Talking about uncharted territory, let's chat about the most shocking aspect of this trailer. Hive Guardians. I think most people have the question, how? How is this possible? Of course, we don't know yet, unless there is some lore in the current season, but we do have a bunch of lore topics we can draw information from. The first thing I would say is, do these Hive Guardians only exist in Savathun's throne world? Remember, she made this throne world in her image. It is her truth. And within this version of her reality, the hive are aligned with the light. I wonder if this is all just a trick, a really potent way to have guardians question their morality. That's the first thing that comes to mind. The second is drawing from the scattered law that describes how ghosts select guardians. There are a number of different descriptions of this process However, they are all very broad and vague. Some ghosts describe it as a feeling. They have this sense that they have discovered their guardian partner and they feel some sort of connection with them. Other ghosts describe scanning someone's soul and even getting an idea of their personality with ghosts picking their yin to their yang, a guardian that complements and completes them. 
Of course, ghosts can make mistakes. There are numerous guardians that become warlords or threaten the city or in general did horrible things. My opinion from looking at the trailer is that the ghosts do not look like they are reviving Hive under their own volition. They are frantic in their process, which is very different to a regular ghost who takes a lot of time and a lot of care when selecting a guardian. Crow's ghost, Glint, is a good example of this. So I would say that the Hive ghosts are under control of Savathun, which I think most people would agree with. I just said it in a really convoluted way. And this is somewhat confirmed in the Witch Queen gameplay, where Ikora says that Savathun stole the light. Have a listen. Savathun, the Witch Queen, Hive God of Cunning and Lies. After the death of her brother Oryx, Savathun went into hiding. Not out of fear, of course, but out of strategy. <laughs> In her greatest trick yet, stealing our most sacred resource. The one thing we thought she could never touch. The light. Ironically, Akora says that this might be her greatest trick yet. Did she really steal the light? Gaul couldn't. Regardless, we do know that there are a number of ghosts that are still unpartnered, that have not found their guardian yet. In fact, there's a network of unpartnered ghosts, known as the Vanguard's Covert Spectral Network. These ghosts look to assist the city without a guardian. It is possible that Savathun targeted ghosts without guardians, or she killed guardians and then captured their ghosts. We know from our Praxic Order lore that ghosts can be captured. In the Praxic Order, they do this quite regularly. They take out the guardian, wait for the ghost to appear for a resurrection, and then trap it. It would not be beyond Savathun to do something similar. Once trapped, I would assume she has some sort of ritual to corrupt, control, and then direct the Hive ghosts to resurrect Hive. We also know that there is nothing really stopping this from happening. Currently, ghosts revive exos, who are literally robots. Yes, they have a human mind, but they are machines. Ghosts also revive Awoken, who are born of the light and the darkness, and ghosts revive humans. The Traveler was previously partnered with the Elixni, and although the Elixni did not have guardians, it reinforces that there is nothing stopping the light being partnered with non-humans. What I'm saying is, I think you could force a ghost to revive any species. Like I said before, ghosts do have some volition over who they choose. So if you can control the ghost, could you control it to revive anyone? The super concerning part about all of this is that ghosts are no longer being made. Ghosts cannot be replaced. So every time Savathun is able to steal a ghost, this is a massive loss for the city. Further, it is even more shocking when we destroy the hive ghosts. We saw footage of us crushing them like Doomslayer after defeating a Hive Guardian. The fact that we don't even attempt to recover the ghost either indicates that Savathun's too strong and there's no way to recover the ghost, or it may indicate my first theory, which is that they are not actually real ghosts, but rather a creation of a throne world. The other interesting thing about the Hive Guardians is that they seem to innately wield the light. A lot of lore from Destiny 1 spoke about how Guardians needed to train and hone their skills in bending the light. And our trainers were often the Vanguard, very skilled Guardians who could wield multiple subclasses. A lot of missions were based around this concept of training your Guardians to wield the light, which unlocked new abilities. These Hive Guardians seem to come out of the gate absolutely swinging. So I do wonder if they need training or I wonder whether just fusing the light with this pure aggression of the Hive just produces these abilities. Now, the last big lore reveal is this. 
the senior narrative lead, Julia Narden, and the narrative director, Adam Grantham, revealed the final chapter for the Light vs. Dark saga. We knew about Witch Queen, we knew Lightfall was coming, and now they announced the final chapter as the final shape. This has a lot of lore significance. The final shape is mentioned multiple times in both the Books of Sorrow and the Unveiling lore book. It refers to the final shape of the universe. The Books of Sorrow refers to the final shape as sort of a motto of the darkness. The Light and the Traveler were all about creation. They gave multiple cities golden ages, whereas the darkness believes we can only reach our perfect form by cutting away the weakness. You whittle the universe down to its perfect form. Have a listen to the lore entry Crusaders. It reads, Their golden age was a cancer. They did nothing to advance the cause of life. They burnt up time and matter and thought on the solipsistic, onanistic pursuit of safety, insulating themselves from death, making a regressive pocket of useless stability. And they could have helped whittle the universe towards its final perfect form. And have a listen to this lore entry from Strict Proof Eternal, also from the Books of Sorrow. It reads, I don't have a strict proof yet, you know. Savathun strokes the void with one long claw and space-time groans beneath her touch. This thing we believe, that we're liberating the universe by devouring it, that we're cutting out the rot, that we're on course to join the final shape, I haven't found a strict eternal proof. We might yet be wrong. The Unveiling Law book has a similar theme. It talks about the light, the gardener, and the darkness, the winnower, and how initially there was balance between the light and the dark. The light would create, the dark would destroy. The book would suggest that the light became unhappy with this because nothing could ever grow or develop. And so the light broke the rules. The darkness would respond to the light and say that it doesn't matter. It is inevitable. The final shape will always prevail. It's a bit hard to know whether the darkness is just saying the darkness will prevail, destruction will always win, decay and entropy will always win, or whether the darkness is saying that when the pattern is maintained, i.e. the light and the dark are balanced, we will get the final shape of the universe. Have a listen to the law entry First Knife. It reads, I looked up in shock. I said, what? What do you mean? A special new rule something to the gardener threw up their hands in exasperation i don't know to reward those who make space for new complexity a power that helps those who make strength from heterodoxy or who steer the game away from gridlock something to ensure there's always someone building something new it'll have to be separate from the rest of the rules running in parallel so it can't be compromised and we'll have to be very careful so it doesn't disrupt the whole game. All you'll do, I said, with rising panic fury, is delay the dominant pattern that will overrun the others. It is inevitable. One final shape. So considering the final shape comes after Lightfall, I wonder if the final shape is a darkness-dominated universe. And there you have it. That is my lore reaction to the Witch Queen reveal Big thanks to Bungie for sponsoring this video. And with that, that concludes this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. If you'd like to support the channel and cannot think of a comment, you can leave the words Hive Guardians. As usual, it's been a pleasure. This is Marlin Games. Peace.